Hello, I'm Paul Grilly. Welcome to Yin Yoga, Foundations of a Quiet Practice. Yin Yoga is a form of yoga that stretches and stimulates the connective tissue of the body. It is intended to complement yang forms of yoga, which stretch and strengthen muscle tissues of the body. As we hope to make clear on these DVDs, yin and yang forms of yoga are mutually beneficial. Both should be practiced. The materials on these DVDs are divided into two main sections. The theory is presented on disc one, and the practices are presented on disc two. On disc one, we explore the benefits of yin yoga and how it differs from yang forms of yoga. On disc one, we also present a step-by-step -step breakdown of the yang sequences presented on the practice disc. On disc two are all the practice materials, including several complete yin sequences and three energizing yang sequences. Yin yoga is beneficial for practitioners of all yoga styles and abilities. We hope you find these DVDs a valuable resource in your yoga practice. Thank you and we hope you enjoy the show. Good evening. Thank you for coming. This is going to be an attempt to sum up for you in a very logical sequence as much as I can why uh, yin yoga is done the way that it is. To do that, we have to contrast it with yang forms of yoga. It doesn't make any sense just to describe a left or a without talking to the right. So we're actually going to cover a fairly broad set of ideas. Yin, yang, Taoism, the theory of exercise. These are the main things I want to touch upon. So hopefully everything that I present is going to build towards why do you do yin yoga the way that you do? In particular, there are two things unique about yin yoga. One is you do it with the muscles relaxed. Two, you hold it for a long time. These are the two things about yin yoga that make it just very different from other forms of exercise that we're exposed to, including other forms of yoga. So everything I'm going to be talking about, hopefully, is building towards that explanation. The two things that make yin yoga unique or different from other forms of exercise, including other forms of yoga. One, the muscles are relaxed. Two, we hold things for a long time. So even though it seems like we will drift far afield, hopefully we'll come back to eventually explain these two points very clearly. Okay. So number one, starting our adventure at the very, very basic broad stroke of things. In Taoism, we have a conception of yin and yang. All things from the subtlest thoughts to the crudest physical forms or violent catastrophes in the physical universe can be described in terms of yin or yang. We are sort of contrived or constrained to describe anything in terms of yin or yang, even if we've never heard those words before. If we describe something as bright or warm or big or good, those very words ev invoke our need to be defined by their opposites cold and dark and little and not good. So language and mental conception, not, not just Chinese language and not just yoga language, but all language and all thought, to describe things we have inherently in our descriptions, yin and yang. Okay? So it's not uniquely um, Chinese in uh, Indian tradition, Tao was sattva, Yin was tamas, and yang was rajas. So this is not something limited to a very narrow uh, perspective. It's actually a very broad um, description of how the mind and how language in particular functions. There might be mental functions that are not dependent on language, but as far as language and communication and teaching and ideas, conceptions and communication, we fall back into yin and yang. Now, one of the things about using this notion is that we can, I can limit myself, or we can limit our dialogue to very brief or flowery or dramatic statements that are very easily to, easy to memorize or to assimilate. For example, this is going to come up a little later. Yang, we say, has a rhythm to it. And yin, we say, has no rhythm to it. Well, a statement like that is never going to be absolutely true. If I say yin has no rhythm to it, 
if you think about it, even a, a yin posture or a yin class, if you're doing five minute holes, you have a five minute rhythm to it. So these short mnemonic phrases that we use, yang is this, yang exercise is this, but yin exercise is this, these are only meant to contrast the extremes, to make it easy to memorize. And usually when you say something dramatic like, yang has a rhythm, yin doesn't, that very strong statement sort of elicits in the background of the hearer's mind, that can't be completely right. That can't be completely right. When someone says something that emphatically, that big, that strong, that can't be completely right. And that's exactly how we want it to be. So that even when I say something that's easy to memorize, easy to think about, easy to turn over in your mind, the stronger I say it, the more in your background of your mind is, that can't be absolutely true. And you sort of look into your mind for exceptions for the things that I say. This is good. This is what we want. We don't want to be stuck in absolutes. We talk in terms of yin and yang, but they're not absolutes. Nothing is absolute anything. Okay, So I'll use the word a lot. We're doing yin yoga. Yin yoga does this. Yang yoga does this. Those broad strokes are meant to elicit from you as the listener a conscientious internal sort of objection, so to speak. No, that can't be completely right. And you are right. There are no absolutes. The stronger the statement, the less true it can be. It's just that it's meticulous and tedious to talk meticulously accurately all the time. So when you talk in these broad phrases, they are not absolutely accurately descriptive the way a mathematician is constrained to be absolutely you know, mathematically descriptive. And we don't, we don't have to labor under those constraints. Okay, so this is the first thing to talk about. It's just easier, faster, in an oral presentation or an oral tradition. It's easier to make big, bold, black and white statements. But it's very important not to get trapped in them. It's easier to speak, it's easier to communicate. But whenever I say something really big and really strong, there should always be creeping up in the back of your mind that can't be absolutely right. That's too strong a statement to make. And that's what we want. That's what's great about the language. The first thing to talk about is general breakdown categorization of yin and yang. How are these terms usually used? Okay? Typically, yin things are solid, are hidden, unchanging, unmoving, unassuming. You don't notice them as much. Yang things are the opposite. They tend to be liquid or moving. And they tend to be very visible. So dark, we don't tend to notice as much. Bright grabs our attention. Movement, we tend to catch something, will catch our eye if it moves. Something that's sort of like not moving, the floor, the wall, we just don't notice it. The thing that we is in our field of vision all the time more than any other object all of our lives is our nose. And yet the brain is so acclimated to it now, it actually takes a mental effort to see your nose. When in fact, it's obstructing our field of vision all the time. It's like the ultimate yin visual object. It's there all the time, but we're so accommodated to it, you have to really kind of like screw yourself up in a funny way to even see it. Okay? And these are entirely contextual. Entirely contextual. They can change with context. So if you're going to discuss things in yin and yang, not only do you have to be generous in your interpretation of absolute strong statements and go like, what, that can't be perfectly right. The other thing is you have to give the author or the speaker the benefit of context because if you take a description, yin and yang, out of context, it doesn't make any sense or could be contradicted very easily. For example, if we were to talk about the heart, your heart, my heart, and the sternum or the breastbone, if we were to talk about which is yin and which is yang, without context, that doesn't mean anything. It's an illogical question in the Taoist viewpoint. 
For example, if we ask, is according to location on the body, which is yin and which is yang? Now we have a context. We have a context of location. That's what in, what's important to us for now, for some reason. By location, the heart is yin because it's hidden, it's inside. You can't see it. You can't even really feel it. You know, you press real hard. Whereas the sternum, you can see. It's right here. You can touch it. So by location, the sternum is yang to the heart, or the heart is yin to the sternum. Now you take these same two physical constructs, and if all of a sudden location is not the important thing we need to be discussing now, if all of a sudden it were um, function or tissue quality, the quality of the tissue itself, now it's changed completely. The breastbone being hard and dense and relatively unchanging, unmoving, is yin. The heart, warm, soft, beating, changing, expanding, contracting, that's yang. So it's completely changed. Is the heart yin or yang depending on what's the context of the discussion? Now you can very clearly define something or an exercise or a function or an idea as, oh, that's a very yin idea. Change the context, it's wrong. And the argument sounds sort of foolish. Is that yin or is that yang? This happens in diet a lot, discussing yin or yang, because some dietary systems from China will tell you a food is yin. And another dietary system from China or Japan will tell you the same food is yang. And you really have to think a little bit deeper about why would they make those statements. The one system of diet says, what is the nature of the food itself? Is it yin or yang? The other system of diet says, what does it re elicit from the body when you eat it, which is usually the opposite. So is a food yin or yang, are you talking about the food itself or are you talking about how it affects the body? These are two examples of how yin and yang only make sense in context. So when we move on, my next job is going to be set the context for what, what do you call yin yoga, yin yoga. What's the context by which you make that definition? For our discussion, the most important thing to consider in the body, there are so many things we could consider in the body, but for our discussion, for this DVD, this presentation, we want to discuss the quality of the tissues. Specifically, we want to talk about are they plastic or elastic? Okay. This is what's important to us in this particular context, this very limited context of this particular DVD articulation of the reasons of yin and yang, why we make these discriminations. Something that is plastic, be like silly putty or clay, you can mold it and as soon as you stop squishing it, it pretty much stays the way that you squished it. You squish it, you set it down, stays like that. Whereas elastic is, you know, you stretch your underwear and let go and snaps back, hopefully. So usually the more a tissue is plastic, it is less elastic, just by definition. So a plastic material is yin. It's slower to change. You set it down, you can look at it for a long time, look, look back, it's still the same. Whereas yang, are things that change. Okay? This is what pretty much the context of everything we'll be discussing. What are we discussing? Why define something as yin or yang in this context? For us, is it plastic or elastic? The quality of the tissue that we're trying to usually stretch. Is it plastic or more plastic or is it elastic? Okay? Because in yoga, at least hatha yoga, Hatha Yoga, we're usually concerned with why don't we move? Why don't we move? If you can do a posture easily, you usually don't question. Yeah, everyone should do this. Feels good. It's when you can't do a posture and that annoying flexible person right next to you can do the posture. Now it becomes important. Okay. So we usually want to know why we can't do a pose. 
Okay. So again, the, in our context, if we can't do a pose, it'll be for one of two reasons. One, the joint is in a state of tension. Or two, the joint is in a state of compression. In any form of yoga, yin or yang, this is the most important fundamental discrimination to make when you're trying to feel what's going on in your body or trying to guess what's going on in someone else's body. Okay? This is the most important discrimination to make. Can this person or can I myself in my practice not bend my knee because the joint's in a state of compression or the joints in a state of tension? Can I not bend my back because the joints are in a state of compression or the joints are in a state of compression, uh, tension? Sorry. This is the most important fundamental distinction to make because what we can or should do is very different if we analyze we think it's tension or if we analyze we think it's compression. Elaborating this idea, is the tissue elastic or plastic? There's a zillions of tissues in the body, okay? For us, we're going to break it down and make it simple. We're going to keep it to three, three tissues. At a joint, a knee, a neck, a spine, a hip, there are three tissues that concern us that we can feel and manipulate and consider. The bone that forms the joint the muscle that moves the joint, and for us, this usually includes the tendon of the muscle. And in between these two is called connective tissue. I'll just abbreviate it as X tissue. The most elastic of these is the muscle and the tendon. You stretch a muscle, it snaps back. The most inelastic or Another way to say it, the most plastic of these tissues is the bone. In between the two extremes, connective tissue. Okay? So we're starting with three tissues. There are other tissues that form a joint, but these are the, what's important for us. These are what we can feel and manipulate directly to our benefit or to our ill, to our detriment. We're going to group these now from three into two. This is typical Taoist analysis. You get it down to yin and yang. You get it down from eight to seven to six to three to two. Eventually, somehow, sooner or later, you get it down to two. So you can make a contrast. And for us, we get it to two by discussing these two things together and contrasting that with muscle. I will say, because I learned from my teacher, Polly Zink, I will say things like stretch your bones, feel your bones, work the chi through your bones. When I say something like that, I do not literally mean take your femur bone and stretch it, take your femur bone and bend it, take your radius bone and stretch it. That's just a colloquial expression for stretch at the joint. And when you stretch at a joint, the connective tissue, it does feel like you're stretching the bone. That's just how it feels. Okay, we'll do a little demonstration of that later. So when we say stretch, we've already eliminated the bone. Bones don't stretch. Now, again, if you go back to the very opening, I'm sure a microbiologist could tell you it stresses, you know, a bone will actually stretch one zero millionth of an inch. That's not important for us, okay? For our consideration, bones don't stretch. Right. So we can't influence the bone, elasticity or movement. That leaves us with these two tissues. Now we're down to a yin and yang. The connective tissue that binds bones, connective tissue is elsewhere in the body and we'll discuss that, but for now, starting with the broad strokes that are typical of a Taoist analysis, the connective tissue that binds the bone is yin and the muscle and its tendons are yang. 
So we're not talking about stretching bone, we're talking about stretching connective tissue or stretching muscle and tendon. Okay, so we've taken all the tissues of the body, weeded them away, and now we're talking pretty much about these two. But if I say stretch your bones in a class or a context, I mean stretch the connective tissue. Shift the feeling or the focus to the connective tissue of the body, as opposed to put the feeling, the attention, and the effort into the muscles and the tendons. Why make this discrimination? Back here, I had said this is the most important discrimination you can make when analyzing the sensations of your own body or guessing or analyzing the sensations of someone else who's attempting to do a posture they find difficult. The most important discrimination to make is attention or is a compression. Now this DVD is not about this so much. First DVD, the anatomy DVD, beats this to death. Tension, compression. For us, just to recap, compression is two things coming together or building pressure between them. Tension are two things being stretched or pulled apart. Every structure in the universe is a balance of tension and compression. The backdrops behind us, these are hanging, they're under tension. The beams holding up the ceiling, they're under weight, they're under compression. Certain parts of our body are under compression, they're almost always the bone. And other parts of our body are under tension, connective tissue, muscle, tendon, ligament. So the big thing to remember when it comes to compression, if we've analyzed, I can't twist my knee or bend my back or my neck because of compression, because of the bones hitting, there's nothing yoga can do to improve that as far as range of motion. We'll talk later that a compression is actually good for your bones. Compression is actually good in moderation. But we're, again, in a Taoist analysis, you always re must remember context. And in this context of what can move, what can be affected beneficially to increase our range of motion, there's nothing we can do about this. When the bones hit, it's over. So that limits us to, okay, but what about the numerous instances where compression is not the issue. It's not because my joints or my bones or my spine or my neck or my elbow are compressed. They're not compressed. I'm too tight, literally. My muscles are too tight. My tendons are too tight. I'm literally, accurately, I'm too tight. So we've gone from, is it tension or compression? Pretty much for the rest of our time in this lecture, we're assuming it's not compression. And we're just going to talk about two different types of tension. Okay, so compression now has been discussed. We'll bring it back briefly later to talk about if compression is actually good for you in moderation. But for range of movement, range of motion, compression is now being discarded from the context of our conversation. And we're now limiting ourselves to tension. That's where we were over here. We got two different kinds of tension that we can feel in the body. And they might be happening simultaneously. Is it a tension due to connective tissue being tight? Or is it a tension due to muscle and or its tendons being tight? Both conditions might be occurring. but to make the conversation easy and clear, we're just gonna assume one or the other for now. In real life, they might overlap in their sensations. But to make it easy to discuss, we're just gonna assume one or the other. Is it tension? Is it compression? We're not considering compression from now on. So now it's tension. What kind of tension? A yin tension? 
of ligament in deep fascial members of the body or a yang tension, the muscle and its tendon? Why bother to make this discrimination? Because if it's yin tissue that we're trying to affect, we are by definition doing yin yoga. And the proper way to affect this type of tissue, fascia and ligament, the proper way to train it is with stasis or stillness and long traction. That is contrasted with its opposite, yang, which is with rhythm or movement and repetition. Why bother to make this discrimination? Because if we are accurate in our analysis, how we should proceed safely to affect those tissues, hopefully for our benefit, will be very different if we're going to do long, slow holds with the muscles relaxed, or rhythmic movements with muscular contraction and repetition. It can be unsafe to flip these around, to exercise a yin tissue with rhythm and repetition can be unsafe. To exercise a yang tissue with stasis, stillness, and long traction can be unsafe. And to make this more clear, we'll go through some very pragmatic examples. Start with yang because we're more familiar with that. We're more acculturated to exercises sweating and huffing and puffing. Yang exercise is sweating and huffing and puffing and movement and rhythm and repetition. It affects the muscles. And the classic example of that would be going to the gym. You go to the gym, you lift a weight, you lower the weight. If you did it only once, you're not ever going to make the cover of a muscle magazine. So the movement by itself is not enough. It must be enough repetition. So movement and repetition or rhythm and repetition. It's easier to remember because it's sort of a literative movement. Rhythm, repetition. This is the characteristic of yang, whether it's running, swimming, inhale, exhale, heartbeat, ta -tum, ta -tum, ta -tum. it's always rhythm and repetition. If your muscle just does this and you never let it down, you will actually injure the muscle. You'll go into a state called tetany. Never good. We feel it in a minor way when we cramp up. It's like, oh, my arm's in a cramp. It's like, why is that not good? I thought we wanted the muscle to be hard. Why is that a not effective way to train? Because there's no movement, there's no repetition. Another example of where I want rhythm and repetition to train the musculature. Imagine putting a big heavy barbell on your back and you're going to do deep squats like this to build up your thighs and the strength of your back. Put a lot of weight on that bar and go down here and hold it for five minutes. You know, probably you'd never be able to straighten your back or use your knees again. Because <laughs> the joints would be under too much duress. Okay? The more young something is, then it should be, the movement should be briefer and quicker. In Taoism, they say a storm only lasts for a brief time. A gentle shower can last all day. It's a poetic way of saying the more young something is, it doesn't last as long, by definition. So certainly, you could do slow squats in the gym, but not when you're using massive amounts of weight. There's always a gray line here. So remember what I had said earlier. Don't exercise yang tissue in a yin way. That's a very strong statement. In the seed of that statement, it should creep up a doubt in your mind. That can't be right all of the time. And you're right. It never is. You can always find an exception. That's what the language is meant to evoke in you, is a questioning reaction. Okay? If we want to train muscle, this is a way to do it. It works very well. 
You, know, you can stand like this and grab the ballet bar and just swing your leg back and forth several times. And by the time you've done that 10 times, you're much more loose than you were before you started. That's just rhythm and repetition. It works very well. You don't want to do that if you're trying to affect a joint. If you're trying to affect a joint and you go into it with rhythm and repetition, there is a good chance that one, you won't be effective, you won't get the change that you would like. Two, worst case scenario, is you injure the joint. Okay. So why make this distinction? Because depending on which tissue we want to affect in our yoga practice, we should adopt, uh, adopt one of two different approaches. A long, steady, slow, gentle traction when I'm addressing joint tissue. Or vigorous, strong movement and repetition when I'm addressing muscular tissue. It might not be safe to do it the opposite way. In fact, this is the reason why people shudder at the notion that you would exercise your joints. Because the underlying assumption is exercise by definition is movement and repetition, vigorous movement and repetition, and vigorous movement and repetition on your gentle joints is not a good idea. And they're right. It's not a good idea. You can only do this so many times before you're going to hurt your neck. <laughs> you know, once or twice, maybe you're OK. But you can only have an explosive, quick, rhythmic movement into your elbow or your knee or your hip or your neck or anywhere, any joint of your body. You might get away with a lot of them. But sooner or later, so you're going to do it not quite the right way, not quite lined up straight, bang, I'm injured. Okay. So this is what we're going to explore next. Because this is the big bugabear in um, the current exercise mode or trend in this country, is that exercising the joints is unsafe. You should never exercise your joints. Or you should do it like this. I'm exercising my elbow. This is OK. If we go by a yin and yang definition, my teeth would be yin because it's bone anchored in bone. Okay? My muscle are yang because it's mostly fluid movement. Imagine someone who's got the idea, I'm going to exercise my teeth because my teeth are crooked. Most people have crooked teeth. If I can develop an exercise system that works not just for my teeth but everyone's teeth, we're going to have a huge impact on people's oral health around the world. And so, trained in Western kinesiology and exercise physiology, they decide first place to experiment is grab a tooth, wiggle it back and forth for three sets of ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, change. One, two, three, four. That program would last about a month, and your teeth would slowly start falling out of your mouth. And then word would go out around the country, exercising the teeth, Bad. Don't exercise your teeth, for God's sake. And then some crazy guy comes along. This is well established now. You don't exercise your teeth. Everybody knows that. It's in every physiology book exercise program in the country. For God's sakes, don't exercise your teeth. Now some crazy guy comes along and says, you know, I want to exercise the teeth. It's like, sure you do. Here's my plan. I'm going to put braces on people's teeth with a very gentle tension. And I'm going to hold it for, I don't, I don't know, days and weeks at a time. If the, guy who are, the people who are reviewing this crazy guy's idea didn't consider how gentle tension for long periods of time is fundamentally different 
from rhythm and repetition, this guy is going to be locked up. He's irresponsible. Look, we've done studies, and the studies show if you exercise your teeth, they will fall out of your mouth. The discrimination those studies don't take into account is all of your studies were of young stresses. Wiggle it hard, wiggle it fast, how many sets? Look, you're still in the realm of rhythm and repetition, yang stresses. No matter how much you change those variables, it's all yang. So yes, you never did find a yang way to affect the teeth therapeutically. To do something with braces and retainers is yin. A very modest stress, very modest. Your braces are too tight. If you ever had to wear braces, if your braces are even moderately too tight, you know, your eyes cross and your brain hurts all day. So it's a very modest stress. Why is it effective? Because it's held for a long time. And if you get in a hurry, you say, I don't want to wear braces for six months. Let's just crank these puppies up and do it in three. You're bringing a yang attitude to a yin therapeutic setting, and it's not going to work. You could crack your teeth. You could injure your teeth. It's like there just comes a point where you could only rush this, which is a yang attitude. Let's do it faster, quicker, harder, and better. There's only so much you can do to rush this. It just takes a certain amount of time for the bones in your mouth to change. Well, we can work it right up to as fast as they will change, but we have to wait for the teeth. We have to wait for the jaw to respond to us. We know now that orthodontia works. You know, it works. Everyone knows that. Orthodontia works. And that's exercising your teeth. Just that we don't think of that as exercise. We think of that as, I don't know what, therapeutic traction or something? But the principle, this is entirely yin. A modest stress held for a long time. If we had a modest stress for just an hour a day on your teeth, it might not be effective. But a modest stress long enough will change the bones in the mouth. So changing your bones in your mouth is much, much harder than trying to stretch the connective tissue or ligaments and other tissues in your joints. This is infinitely harder to do in more patient and therapeutics. Why well, you need a professional to help you do it in special instruments. But the principle is the same. Yes, they've done studies forever that if you're too aggressive in your movements, in a young way, playing baseball or lifting a weight or doing a spinning class, if you're too aggressive in your joints, you injure them. Okay, that's just, no one's going to deny that. If they do, they're insane. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> doing something safely, whether it's riding the bike, lifting a weight, whatever it is, when the instructor is certified and comes up to you, let me teach you how to do this safely, pretty much what they're saying is this. Let me do this with minimal stress to the joint. That's pretty much what they're saying to you. Let me teach you how to do this so we minimally stress your joints. Now, you can't avoid stressing your joints. You move your body under weight with tension, you're stressing your joints in a good way. So doing it safely is throw the shot put, lift the box, do whatever with minimal stress to the joints. So all the rules here are about how can we protect the joints from stress. And they all work, and they're all true, and they're all very well researched, and now they're sort of like they're common sense to us now. So some guy like, I don't know, me, comes along and says, we want to stress the joint. We don't want to protect 
the joint. So what are you, crazy? Yin yoga wants to do this to the joints of the body. Everything else that we do is, for God's sakes, protect the joint from undue stress. Okay? And the reason for that, it's built on a fundamental and outmoded idea of what is the nature of the connective tissue of the body. Doing it safely, minimal stress to the joints. Yin yoga is trying to stress the joints, hopefully in a safe therapeutic way, but we're trying to stress the joints. We're not trying to protect the joints from stress. We're trying to subject the joints to stress. This is radically different, right? You can't get more different than this when you're doing exercise versus yoga or yang yoga versus yin yoga. You can't get more seemingly contradictory than this idea. Do it like this so you don't stress the joint. Do it like that so you do stress the joint. This is as opposite as it gets. Yin and yang. What crazy guy would advocate stressing the joints? This gets back to the theory of exercise okay what is the theory of exercise In the old days it was actually subsumed under a much broader and bigger idea which we now think we've outgrown but we haven't it's called the theory of sacrifice theory of exercise we'll build up to it with a story my goal is to get stronger. I want to strengthen my muscular tissue. So I go to a gym. And I go over, I grab a bunch of heavy weights, and I go like, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. And if I work out really, really hard, when I leave the gym, I am weaker than when I went in. Isn't that kind of weird? And I spend my time and my money to get stronger. And I walk out of the gym a weaker. You know, when you listen to the, I don't know what it's like in the girls' locker room, but in the guys' locker room, it's like, great workout, man. I can hardly tie my shoes. <laughs> and this is a good thing? Yeah, we all know it's a good thing, right? Because we know, or from experience, we hope, we expect that making the muscles weaker is temporary. And that tomorrow or the next day, or three days from now, who knows when, the muscle be, will be rebuilt. It will not just be repaired it will actually be adapted or improved. Okay? We expect this. That's why we lift the weights. That's why we're happy when we have a great workout and I can't even tie my shoes. We're happy about that. Because we expect that the stronger stresses we've subjected the muscles to, some magic thing is going to happen. The stronger the stress, the more, the more effectively we exhaust the muscle. We expect and hope that we'll come back not only repaired, but improved, stronger and more elastic. Okay. This is now so fundamental, we don't even give it much thought. Yeah, of course, you go to the gym, you work, you get weaker than when you went in. Why do you do it? Because we expect this to happen. How, how does this happen? How does tissue get stronger when it's subjected to stress and broken down conscientiously? Nobody knows. Nobody knows how this happens. 
They've been studying muscle fibers for like 50, 100 years. They still don't know whether it's because muscle cells get bigger that you get stronger or if because you get, they split in half and you get more of them. Nobody knows. It's pretty fundamental, isn't it? You would think by now with all the smart people we have out there, we'd know. We don't know. Because you're getting close to explaining life when you can answer a question like that. You're getting close to explaining life to answer that question. It's not a simple thing. If I have a twine here in my hand and I just rub it back and forth a little bit with my finger, just a very light scraping of the twine, sooner or later that twine will snap and wear through, right? Because it's an inanimate object. There is no chi. Well, this is not, again, this is not absolutely true. All things have chi. But anyway, it doesn't have chi. It can't adapt to stress. Living tissues, these are examples of adapting to stress. The theory of evolution is based on an idea like this. Okay? Adapting to stress. This is what living things do. So when we take our shoes off in the warm months of the year and we start walking along, do we wear all the skin off the bottoms of our feet and by fall time we're walking on bloody nubs? Or does the opposite happen? Does do the feet get thicker on the bottom and calloused and easier to adapt to those things? Well, we all know the opposite happens. That doesn't happen with inanimate objects. If Firestone could do that with your tires, they'd make a, well, they'd go broke, actually, because they'd sell you one pair of tires, and that'd be it. <laughs> Inanimate objects don't adapt to stress. That's a very good definition. There could be many definitions of life and living and non-living, but this is a pretty good one. Inanimate objects don't adapt. They just wear out. Yeah. You scrape that string, that piece of twine, a little bit, back and forth, back and forth, a little bit. After a while, whoosh, mountains wear down and twine breaks. But if that's a living tissue, if that piece of twine now represents a muscle fiber or a tendon, and you scrape it a little bit, as long as you don't overdo it, it grows back stronger than before. They use this principle now in rehabilitating cruciate ligaments in the knee. Cruciate ligament is, you have a, it's in between, the, it's in the joints and you have the knee coming down here, the upper bone of the thigh, and you have the tibia down here. And in here you got these cruciate ligaments that cross one another, that's why they're called cruciate. And you got guys, skiers in particular, who partially tear the ligament there. Doesn't tear all the way through but a very serious destabilizing injury right there. Torn. This is very common. Do you know what some of the advanced surgical procedure is now to heal that? They go in with a, I don't know what instrument, and they very slightly abrade that wounded surface. Isn't that kind of a crazy idea? It's already partially torn, and they go in and abrade the surface. What are you doing? They know, as you might expect, that for some mysterious reason, when you abrade the surface like that, the body starts to grow in that ligamentous chunk. And if it doesn't do it completely the first time, they might actually risk doing it another time and go in and abrade it to try and stimulate the body's reaction to, oh, okay, I'll fill it in the rest of the way. And now I've got a whole ligament again. This is really bizarre. The body has the ability to heal the ligament from the beginning. That's obvious because it just did it. Why doesn't the body just heal the ligament? Why does it command an intervention from the outside, whether it's the student himself or from a doctor that has to go in and sort of jumpstart this power that's already in the body? Look, nobody knows. I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Why do muscles get stronger after you exhaust them? I don't know. Nobody knows. How strong will you eventually get? 
I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. How long will your strength last? I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. We're sort of trapped in a mystery. We expect certain things from exercise and other things that we do. We can't explain them. It's just based on experience. When you start to question them, and then it gets a little head turning around. Why would stressing a muscle until it's exhausted and fails and can't tie your shoes, why is that a good thing in the long run? The yogis, the Taoists, say, they don't explain why, they just say, because you stimulate a vital life force called prana in India or chi in China, and that this mysterious life force is responsible for restructuring living tissues to better withstand stress. Inanimate objects don't adapt to stress. They just wear out within limits. And everything's within limits. Within limits, living tissues adapt to stress. So it makes them unique. If you shoot an astronaut into space, and leave the astronaut there for, I don't know, I don't know how, many, how long it has to be, can't remember now, a few weeks. You bring the astronaut down, she will have lost 15 to 20 percent of the density of her bones in a few weeks. Why? She's in a weightless environment. You don't need strong bones in your legs and your hips and your pelvis to hold up a weightless body. So in just a few weeks time, this much bone density is lost. A lot of science fiction guys will write you know, speculative things about what would human beings look like if they lived for two or three generations on the moon or something where the gravity is very light. And they develop sort of like into bird-like people that if they came to the Earth and they stepped off the spacecraft, their bones would break because Earth's gravity would be too much. I bring this up because even bones, hard, dense, tough bones, like our teeth. If they're not stressed in a good way, they degenerate. Even the bones. Now, very, very simple premise. We all understand it. Use it or lose it. Even the bones of the body. So why belabor this? This is so obvious when we talk about the muscles, go to the gym, stress the muscle, I get weaker, I've worn the muscle out, but it builds back stronger. Why belabor this obvious thing we've all been exposed to? Because the connective tissues of the joints are subject to exactly the same laws and the same premises. If you don't stress a joint, it will atrophy. Now, if you overstress it, you'll injure it. But if you don't stress a joint, it will atrophy. And if you stress it, theory of exercise, if we stress our joints, our joint tissues, within limits, always within limits, they adapt and the tissues improve. It's true of every tissue of the body. It does not stop with the connective tissue. There's a very old antiquated idea that the ligaments, which is a special name of the connective tissue that binds the bones together, are inanimate. They are inert. They're perfect the way God made them. And if you stretch them, number one, you won't be successful because they don't stretch. Number two, if you are successful in stretching them, you've damaged them. Now your joint is destabilized, and sooner or later you're going to have arthritis because your bones are rubbing funny. Okay? That, lo that argument falls apart once you explode the notion that ligaments are inert. Ligaments lengthen and contract every day. Ligaments lengthen and contract. When a ligament contracts, 
is called contracture as opposed to a muscular contraction. This process in most instances, everyday life, is very slow and unnoticeable. But in certain scenarios, it speeds up, meaning the ligament shrinks and contracts, hence the name contracture. And the scenario in which this happens most aggressively is immobilization. When a joint, which is where the ligaments are, is immobilized in a cast or neck splint or something, when a joint is immobilized, usually for good reason, it's got to be therapeutically immobilized because there's something wrong, you don't want it to get worse. But when a joint is immobilized for whatever reason, contracture is more aggressive. And the not only does it contract, the tissue degenerates. It becomes less strong, less elastic, the fibers in the ligaments that are usually a little bit kind of wavy but parallel to one another, they're not straight, but they're kind of wavy. They start to cross over one another more. It becomes a less functionally effective elastic uh, material. So when a joint is immobilized, when ligament is immobilized, everything about the joint degenerates, just like the astronaut in space. Everything about the joint degenerates when you're immobilized. Articular cartilage degenerates. Circulation to the joint generates, ligaments degenerate, the muscles obviously degenerate. If you've ever had an immobilized limb, a broken leg or something, arm, the muscles atrophy very quickly. Every tissue in a joint will degenerate during immobilization. And processes like contracture, which are normally very subtle things going on all the time, for good reason, now take over and become overly aggressive. Classic example of this is frozen shoulder syndrome. Grandma falls down, sticks out her hand, falls, bang, breaks her wrist. Her arm is put, bones are set, arm is put in a sling. Six weeks later, you take the sling off. The hardest part of rehabilitation is she can't move her shoulder now. The shoulder that was never hurt and has been resting in a sling for six weeks. Not the wrist, that's not the hardest problem. This first, you got to get her to move first. What happened? It was never hurt. The wrist was hurt, the shoulder wasn't hurt, and it's been resting in a sling for six weeks. This happened. A process that is going on all the time in the body, in a very small pulse type of movement or rhythm, once the joint was immobilized, just took over. Like any other tissue of the body, it's not going to lay down more tissue than it needs. And if the joint that used to do this, the ligaments would have to be so long, if the joint now just does this or nothing at all, ligaments don't need to be very long to allow that to happen. So this is a very natural function. But in an immobilization state, bad things happen. And the, the deleterious effects of immobilization are myriad. This is why you have starting with million dollar athletes and now trickling down to you and I, where it used to be, put them in a plaster of Paris cast, put their leg up and leave them there for six weeks. We'll think about rehabilitating them later. Look, this sends shivers down a PT spine now to even think about that. What does a PT do when a million dollar athlete limps off the football field and has a stress fracture in their foot? They have that guy moving from day one. Now they have to be careful. The bone is broken. So they're going to put them in a machine where they can't even make a mistake. It's like you can only move this much. But they'll get this guy moving from day one. And take it even further, what is the reputation of a physical therapist? Does anybody like their physical therapist? <laughs> Nobody likes their physical therapist. Because the physical therapist doesn't care how much it hurts. They just want you to move. Why are they so sadistic? Because they know that immobilization is probably worse than the original injury. Isn't that weird? Unless you've got a multiple fracture in your leg, sports fractures, you know, unless they're skiing at 1,000 miles an hour, immobilization might have worse long-term effects on the body if it's not properly addressed. You can recover from a broken bone. You can recover from torn and sprained muscles and tendons. 
But the, if the physical therapy, if the intervention doesn't happen soon, early on in the process, and complete, they'll never be the same again. Now this is a complete change in the last two or three decades. Complete change. Why are these crazy OTs and PTs now you know, horrified by immobilization when for a few hundred years, medicine isn't that old, so 100 years, 150 years, you just like, you had a baby, rest. Fell off your horse, rest. Broken leg, rest. Made it worse. So immobilization, big problem, because all the tissues degenerate, all of the tissues degenerate, including the ligaments. Just like bone, just like teeth, just like muscle, just like tendon. If these tissues are not sometimes routinely, within limits, stressed, they degenerate. If they are stressed, like in lifting weights or doing yoga, they rehabilitate. This is just a law of life. And it doesn't stop at the joints. It isn't like, oh, that's true for the muscles, but it's not true of the joints. It's true for the bones, but it's not true of the joints. That's just a mistaken idea. It's old now. Okay? It's not true. Immobilization is bad. All these tissues degenerate, and ligament, connective tissue, fascia, tendon, all those tissues get better or worse with proper exercise or stress. So stressing a ligament modestly, regularly, is just as commonsensical and therapeutic as going to the gym and stressing your muscles. It's just how the body stays healthy. I don't know why it's set up that way. I don't know why you have to stress a tissue to keep it healthy. No one knows why, it just is. If you don't stress a tissue, it degenerates. If you overstress a tissue, you deteriorate it. Life is somewhere between that yin and yang. A healthy life is somewhere between not stressing the tissue at all, it's going to degenerate if you don't stress it enough. If you overstress it, it will deteriorate. Life is somewhere in between, slightly different for everybody. I said eventually we'd build to this. Yin yoga is done with the muscles relaxed. That's a weird thing, isn't it? Aren't you supposed to like flex all the time to exercise? Isn't that what exercise is? Well, now we've come to a definition that that's a yang form of exercise. Muscles should be relaxed in yin yoga, and you should hold it for a long time. Everything we've been discussing is sort of building to explain these two ideas. So why are the muscles relaxed? How can you even call it exercise if the muscles are relaxed? Well, maybe we shouldn't call it exercise. Maybe we should call it something else. I've chosen to call it yin forms of exercise, but you know we could brainstorm and come up with another thing to call it. A typical model of a joint is this. I'll draw the knuckles of your hand in my artistic endeavors. There's a little bone like that. Another little bone like that. This is your tip of your finger out here. Little fingernail. Fingernail polish. Okay. This is a structure of a joint. These are the bony structure of a joint. What goes around the joint? What goes around every joint of the body? A layer of ligament goes all the way around every joint. And inside that joint is synovial fluid. Okay? So a layer of ligament goes around every joint, tight. And what goes over the top of a joint? I'll make this insertion down here and here. The tendon of a muscle that's up in your forearm. So this is the tendon of the muscle. It's literally superficial or yang to the joint itself. If it's our desire to stretch that joint capsule, or to, excuse me, to stress that joint capsule, this must be relaxed. 
Because if this tendon or the muscle it's attached to, whether you say the tendon is tight or the muscle is tight, it's synonymous. It means the same thing. If this is tight, one of the things muscles do is pull bones together. So if this were a string and we pulled on it, it would pull and close all these joint spaces in the hand. And so this would actually go a little bit loose. When the muscle is tight, the joint capsule is actually a little loose. Okay? And you can feel that very palpably. If you focus on this joint where your finger joins to the palm, if you pull on it and the and muscles in your forearm are relaxed, you can actually feel the joint capsule right there at your knuckle being stretched. You can actually put your finger on it and feel the crevice open up under the tip of your finger. You're stretching the joint capsule, which means you're stretching that ligament band right there. And that's why the, Ch the Chinese would say, stretch your bones, because that's where it feels like. You don't even really feel the gap in between. You sort of feel where the ligament is anchored to the bone. Hence the phrase, stretch your bones, work your bones. But you're really stretching this. So to do that, I had to relax this muscle so I could pull these apart and stretch that. Now do the opposite. Do yang activity. Straighten your fingers like that. Okay? When you straighten your fingers like that, these tendons across the tops of your fingers are pulled tight. This string is pulled tight, which means these joint spaces close up. And these ligaments are actually slack now. But you wouldn't know because when you pull on it, if you extend your finger and keep it extended and try to pull on it, you can't move the joint. Because this, is, this muscle tendon up here is too tight to allow that to happen. You can go like this. If you tense your hand real tight and you pull like this, you're not doing anything to the joint. Nothing. You're fighting your pull against the muscular tendon. Now this might, might be, it's kind of silly, but this might be a good yang exercise for your hands maybe, exercising the muscles and the tendons. Maybe, I don't know, I don't think so. But it's definitely not stressing the joint. Okay? It's definitely not stressing the joint to have the muscle that's going across the joint tight. Whether it's the finger or your neck or your sacrum or your back, it doesn't matter. If the muscle is tight, the joint capsule will no longer take a stress which is exactly why, as we talked earlier, learning to do something safely usually involves which muscles to keep contracted. Contract the muscles of your back so the joints aren't stressed. Now go down straight like this. Don't use your back, for God's sakes, and pick up a box. Because now I didn't stress my joints over much. The opposite would be, relax the muscles of the spinal column. Now all the joints in my back could possibly be stretching. Then I engage them and pull them back up. Some would say, in every instance, this is the safe way because I'm protecting my joints. And this is the unsafe way because right at this moment, my joints are exposed to stress because I've relaxed the muscle. Now that's undeniable. If you relax, the, this is your spine now, not your finger. If I relax my spinal muscles in this posturing, my joints are under stress. The question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's the issue. Is stressing the joints a good thing or a bad thing? Because all the stuff you read about, don't stress your joint, learn to do it safely. Don't lift with your back, lift with your legs, don't lift with your back, lift with your legs. It's the underlying assumption there is stressing your joints is bad. But the discrimination to make is, is the stress I'm subjecting this spine now to is it a yin stress or a yang stress? 
Is it brief, explosive, powerful, and big, and I'm slamming into my back and jerking my back up again as I push this weight over my head? Or is it a very modest, very gentle, even some of the weight in my hands, relaxed forward bend, which is just a few pounds of stress hanging gently onto the tissue without bouncing? This makes a huge difference. Yang stresses could injure your spine severely. I don't think anyone will question that. Bouncing and jerking and lifting and pulling aggressively into your back or your other joints of your body, your knees. I don't think anyone would say, hey, that's a good idea. But you cannot equate Yang rhythmic aggressive stresses with yin, very gentle, long, sustained stresses. They're not the same. They're not the same. Okay? This is a huge thing. This stress and this stress isn't like yin is sissy yang. Yin is for people who aren't tough enough to slam into their joints. They're fundamentally different. If I do this, a lot, slam my foot into the floor. Basketball players do this all the time. They have thousands of pounds of stress per square inch on their feet when they do that, particularly when they jump and they land. Thousands of pounds of stress on their feet. How many basketball players stretch the ligaments in their feet? Nobody. No basketball player ever overstressed the ligaments in his feet unless he rolls his ankle over. They will fracture the bones in their foot. That happens all the time. Stress fractures occur all from bang, oh, I just, I just stress fractured my foot. That happens all the time. But the ligaments, don't, you don't end up with flat feet from playing basketball. Why not? You have thousands of pounds of stress. Why don't the feet just go, oh, forget it, and just flatten out? Because brief, young stretches, bang, thousands of pounds, but it's very brief and it's over, it's done, I'm off now. Ligaments and connective tissue, deep fibers, won't respond to that. It's like, mm, okay, I'm done, I got that. They're perfectly designed to stabilize the joint that way, because mm, you put a brief stress on them, they don't yield. What about the 90-pound waitress who stands like this all day? She's got soles on her shoes this thick, and her feet give her problems all the time because she's losing her arches. She's getting fallen arches. Why? It's only, you know, it's 50 pounds each foot. Thousands of pounds won't do it. 50 pounds on each foot will. Why? Because she stands like that for minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes at a time every day. So if you want to stress ligament, it doesn't have to be big and fast. That won't do anything. It's got to be a very modest stress for a long time. Now, for a waitress, that's a bad thing. But if you're trying to rehabilitate someone's lower spine and iliosacral joints, that's a good thing. A very modest stress for a long time. Now, how long is a long time? Five minutes, 10 minutes? You know, this, this varies. But it isn't like, here, let me pull on you real fast. I don't think any sane person would think that would be therapeutic. And yet now they've, they've, they've got machines that they strap a person to a table and strap their upper torso to one half of the table and the lower torso to the other half, and then they crank the tables apart to decompress the spine. And they back off, and then they do it again. 30 second rounds for, I think, half an hour to rehabilitate the back to avoid surgery. Now, that sounds like yin yoga to me, doesn't it? You strap someone to a table, they're relaxed, and you crank their spine apart. These are candidates for surgery. They're in a lot of pain. Why are they doing that? Because longer therapeutic stresses are beneficial for the ligament. Normally, uh, surgery candidates, the spines are 
contracted and collapsed. The ligaments have aggressively contractured. And we're trying to coax them to get some movement back. Okay? So this is an incredibly important discrimination to make. A long, slow, modest traction is nothing like repetitive, aggressive contractions. They're nothing the same. It isn't like one's a modest, but they're totally different. This will actually shorten up your ligaments. Repetitive movements like that, your body will get tighter. It's called tractor back. They studied farmers riding tractors. They end up like this. Can't move at all. Repetitive, aggressive motions, the ligaments contract to protect the joints. You can't have your bones bouncing around riding on your tractor or something. It's like the body's doing the best it can. Whereas long, stable tractions are like braces on your teeth. They're like these new therapeutics where they strap you into a device and stretch your back apart. It wouldn't make any sense to strap someone to one of these therapeutic benches and then they tensed up their muscles. Well, now they're fighting against their back being pulled apart. You'd have to go in and say, what are you doing? I'm exercising my back. Well, yeah, you're exercising the yang tissues of your back. The problem is in your ligament. We need to stop doing that. Just relax so the table can pull your back apart. Oh, OK. So when we do backward bends, forward bends, spinal twists, when we're doing our yoga practice, there's nothing wrong with sometimes doing it with all the muscles engaged in all these various ways. That's good for the muscles of the spine. It's good for them. But at the same token, it is just different and not wrong to purposely let the joints take the stress in a gentle, relaxed, passive environment where you're unlikely to overdo it. So is stressing the joints, we started this with, is stressing the joints good or bad? Fundamental question asked, are you talking a yang stress getting hit by a bus? Are you talking a yin stress being strapped to a table or doing a long forward bend in my yoga class? Because those are two different things. Not to say you couldn't overdo this. You can overdo any therapeutic. You, know, you can overdo yang activity and do yourself more harm than good. You can overdo yin activity and do yourself more harm than good. That doesn't invalidate the principle that all tissues, including all the joint tissues, need to be stressed regularly, systematically, rationally, and persistently to keep them healthy. And if we're going to stress the joint capsules in our fingers and in our spines, the muscles must be relaxed so that the joints take the stress. That's why there's yang yoga. And the very same pose with the muscles relaxed is now yin yoga. Same pose. One is I'm focused on my muscles protecting my joints. The other is I'm relaxing my muscles to intentionally stress my joints. One is not superior to another. It's just two different tissues. Is it this layer up here, the muscles of your back, or this layer in here? the eight layers of ligament that run up your spine. Eight layers of ligament that run up the spine. There are four reasons why you want to stress the joints of your body. To avoid the degeneration that occurs from prolonged immobilization. This just goes hand in hand. If a joint or any tissue of the body is immobilized for an extended period of time, it degenerates. Two, to work against contracture, which is happening all the time. Three, to work against joint fixation, which is happening all the time. Four, to stimulate the production 
of hyaluronic acid. These are four reasons why you want to exercise your joints. None of these things have to do with will you become a contortionist in Cirque du Soleil. Okay. We've, I've been talking at great length about this. And if you analyze most people's adults' movements in the modern Western world, their lower spine is essentially in an immobilization from morning till night, birth till death. You know, they sit at the desk here, which is four times more compressive for your lumbar spine than standing, by the way. Four times more compressive to sit than to stand. Sit like this. Am I bending or stretching my spine? No. Stand like this. Walk to my car. Sit like this in my car. Lay back like this in my couch. And then lay flat on my bed. Where came using the joint in the modern person's day? Doesn't happen. 80% of the Western world suffers from chronic or serious back pain some phase in their life. 80%. There was a guy from New Zealand studied this problem. <laughs> he, he was successful in regenerating people in their 60s and 70s from chronic back problems. He was inspired by the fact that after World War II, he toured through all of Asia on his way back home and noticed that peoples in poor countries labored like this in the fields all day long for hours at a time. Because centuries had taught them that going straight back like this isn't good for you that you harvest and pick and work like this. Now they might get elephantiasis from parasites in the water, but they don't have bad backs. He was very successful in rehabilitation. He, he specialized in geriatric patients. His name was Victor Barker. He wrote a book, Posture Makes Perfect. MD, trained guys, and his biggest therapeutic for healing people in their 60s and their 70s and 50s from back problems his biggest therapeutic was stiff-legged deadlifts. Take these guys with their bad backs and have them grab stiff legs so they can't do this and pull the thing up. That was the main system of his therapeutic. And according to him, he was very successful. The joint, like anything else in the body, if you don't use it, it degenerates. And modern peoples essentially don't use this joint structure the way it's designed to be used, which is like this and up to here. Even when we go to the gym after doing this all day and this all day and this all day, now even if this guy goes to the gym because his back is killing him, he's taught in all of his exercise classes, engage the muscles of your spine. So even when he does bend over, he's not working the joints of his back. It's ironic. Now, don't get me wrong. This is a very good thing to learn to do. This is very important to learn to strengthen the muscles in your back. You need to learn how to do that. But to imply this is wrong isn't right. It's a fundamentally flawed idea. The joints need to be stressed. If the dentist told you you need to floss your teeth every day, and the first time you went to floss your teeth, your gums were bleeding, and you stopped because you thought it's not a good idea because it makes your gums bleed, you don't get it. Your gums are bleeding because they're degenerated. They can't take the stress of flossing. If it hurts someone's back in a modest way to start to use it, and they stop, they don't get it. Now, I understand that. I understand it's like you're out there on your own and you start to do some exercise and your back hurts. You don't know if that's good or bad. I understand that. Okay? That's why I'm doing this elaborate two-hour presentation about in a very safe, very controlled environment with very modest stresses in a yin yoga class. If you go about it carefully, maturely, sanely, patiently, It'll regenerate the back, not injure it, regenerate it. So, degeneration and contracture, 
need to fight against that. Joint fixation is related to these two. Joint fixation is when two surfaces stick together. How can my hands moving apart make a cracking, popping sound? I can understand that because of friction. But why would that happen? I just pulled my bones apart. Why would there be a popping sound pulling my bones apart or moving my palms apart? It's called fixation, joint fixation. When you take a hard, smooth surface like the bottom of your glass on a hot summer day with ice in it and water, and you set it down on a nice, smooth, hard surface like a coaster, and the water flows down, and you pick the glass up, the coaster comes with it. Why does the coaster come with it? Because the fluid has formed a seal between the glass and the coaster. It's now stuck. And you go, and you've defixated. The conditions for fixation are smooth surfaces with a little bit of fluid in between them, held in a confined space. That's every joint in your body, particularly the facets of the spine, particularly the iliosacral joints down here. They're under, they're not only, not only are you setting the glass down, you're pushing on it. There's direct pressure into this area of the spine. As soon as you get upright, you got all the weight of your torso now pressed down on the iliosacral joint here and the lumbar spine. Fixation happens all the time up in the upper back, rib articulations, facet articulations. This happens all the time. And for some people, at some point, somewhere, sometime, one or both sides of the iliosacral joint become fixated permanently. Because the ligaments are so tight, they're never going to, they can't pull that much to make it pop. Because the ligaments are so strong. There's no more ligamented area in your body than this down here. You see a picture in an anatomy book? It is massively ligamented down there. And guess where everyone has their lower back problems? Down there. That's, if you want to create a mysterious reputation for yourself, go to a party and someone says, oh, my back. And you say, L5, S1? They'll go, how did you know that? That's where everyone hurts. That's where everybody hurts. Because it's a chronically immobilized, degenerated portion of our body. It's chronic. So it's no mystery. You'll be right 99 times out of 100. That's where everyone has these problems of degeneration, contracture, and fixation. And that's why old people walk like this. Why do they walk like that? because they can't push their pelvis under them anymore. It's not their upper back that's a big deal. That's a different problem. It's because their butt's behind them. Why is their butt behind them? Because they can't do that. They would get correct posture if they could just do that. Can't. Iliosacral joints totally fixated on both sides, and the L4 and L5 uh, vertebrae are probably fused together by this time. They don't have a joint there. If it's fixated, you don't have a joint. It's not moving by definition. And when you're older, trying to stretch the ligaments is a very difficult job. And the ligaments are binding so tight, you can't stretch the glass off the coaster enough to make it defixate. So what do we do in our yoga practice here, steadily over time? If you've ever done yoga, started yoga late as an adult, and then you start doing your yoga practice, what you notice right away, or not right away, after some period of time, you notice you get cracks and pops all over your spine all the time that weren't there before. What's that about? Because in a modest yoga practice, even a beginning yoga practice, you're helping to stimulate and pull these fixations apart, keeping the ligaments and the muscles loose enough so that with a little movement or a twist or if your friend steps on your back, 
the fixation goes away. You break the fixation. That's why when someone steps on your back, you go, ah, oh, that feels so good. Why should it feel good? I can understand you get up and then you move more. You go, oh, wow, I can move more. But why does it instantly feel good? Oh, thank you. It feels so good. That's what we're building to. and It's building to this. Why does it instantly feel good to get cracked? This final of the four reasons of why to stress your joints, this is called hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is produced in the connective tissue of the body. Hyaluronic acid is the major constituent of synovial fluid in the body. Hyaluronic acid, depending on which book you read, hyaluronic acid is a coiled molecule like this that's in the connective tissue of your body. And it can pull 1,000, depending on who you read, to 6,000 times its weight in water to itself. So if you, have a thou if you had a pound of hyaluronic acid and you spread it out on this floor, it would hold a thousand pounds of water here and not let it run out of the room. This is produced in the fibroblasts, you don't need to know that, fibroblasts of the connective tissue. Stressing the connective tissue has been shown to, gent to improve hyaluronic acid production by the existing fibroblasts and to increase the number of fibroblasts. So not only are they all functioning better, these cells that are in the connective tissue, there's more of them. One of the things about growing older is, no matter what we do, it seems like, so far anyway, fibroblast numbers go down. The living cells in the tissue slowly die away, and there's less of them. And we're left with a lot of fibers and just a few cells generating hyaluronic acid. When we're young, we have a lot of cells in the fibers. That's why we're so loose. That's why we recover so quickly and we're so hard to hurt. As we age, these things tend to die and the population density of these important cells generating hyaluronic acid goes down. And now you don't have as much hyaluronic acid. You're literally drier. You are literally less elastic. The greatest amount of hyaluronic acid is in the eyeball. But other than that, the greatest amount of hyaluronic acid concentration in the body is in the synovial fluid of the joints. Okay. Why is this important? This little thing right here is sort of the climax of this lecture. Of these four reasons of why we're exercising the joints. Why did I throw this one? Who cares about this biomechanics? chemical thing that's happening in the connective tissue of your body. My teacher is Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama. He and several others, including a guy named James Oshman, who scans the medical li literature and stuff for work, and people like Stephen Birch and others. He's just a handful of guys have been putting together something for a few decades called the modern, or I call the modern meridian theory. Modern meridian theory. The essence of it is this. The meridians exist as water-rich phases in the connective tissue of the body. That's what they are physically. Okay. But they're unique. Okay. They're unique in this way. An artery or a vein or a nerve or a bone has a membrane that forms a tube. And it's easy to find. You go in there, you go like, hey, there's a tube there. There must be something in it. It's an artery, it's a vein, it's a nerve. Meridians you won't find a membrane with a tube in it. You don't find that. What you have are little granules of spiraled hyaluronic acid molecules. 
Now, in a corpse, you wouldn't even sort of look at that because there's little bits of hyaluronic acid in all the connective tissue everywhere. You'd have to be looking for, wait a minute, there's a lot of it. And it's right here in a line like that. You'd have to be specifically looking for that. Because what happens when you die and you do your dissection on that cadaver? Not when you die. <laughs> when someone dies, the first thing that happens is all of the fluids dissipate from all of the tissues. And you go into rigor mortis. You don't find a water-rich segment of connective tissue in a corpse. You don't find it. But if you look real close with your microscope and you're looking for a reason, you will find dense layers and lines of hyaluronic acid. You're like, why is it there and so thick and not right next to it over here and not next to it over there? And when you analyze it, that track, this has all been done in the skin, by the way. It hasn't been done inside the body yet. But in the skin, in the dermis of the skin, that's an acupuncture meridian. And when this guy was alive, water was gathered around the hyaluronic acid molecules. The hyaluronic acid molecules don't form a membrane around the water. It's the inversion of that. It's the yin and the yang of that. Rather than fluid on the inside, tissue on the outside, the apt meridian inverts that and puts the tissue that's holding it together on the inside, and the water's wrapped around it. Totally cool. And when you're alive, my teacher in particular, but many of these other guys too, but my teacher, Dr. Madhyama, has studied where does it flow, how does it flow, what's its speed, how is it different from the nervous system, where does it go, how does it interact with other meridians. This is hugely important, okay? That this explains what the meridians are. They've mapped many, 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 many things about the meridians now to show that they're totally different from the nervous system. Nervous system travels, an impulse in the nervous system travels something like 180 meters in a second. Now that's nothing anywhere close to the speed of light, but it's like really fast. Meridian impulses travel at about one meter and four seconds. That's very slow. It takes four seconds to travel the height, length of the spine. Four seconds. In four seconds, an electrical impulse would have gone 800 meters. So there are many things that we're not going to get into in this particular DVD about this, because we're more informed about the immediate practical mechanics of how we're doing postures. But let me retrace why am I talking about what little I am now. Okay, Hyaluronic acid and its production is in the connective tissue, stimulating the connective tissue in yin yoga and in yang yoga stimulates the cells in the production of hyaluronic acid. So it's not just about, well, now I'll be able to bend more. Even if, you, even if you're a very advanced yogi, you don't bend anymore after your yoga practice. You're the same pretty much for a long time. Why do you keep doing your practice? To stimulate this production. Because energetically, after every class, you feel different. After every class, even though your range of motion is what it was yesterday, which was what it was last week, why do you keep doing it? Why did the yogis invent asana postures? Why? Why not heavy hands, mini tramps, spinning, something? You know, why these bizarre contortions and positions? Because when you're spending hours and hours and hours in deeper and deeper meditative states and you're eating very little and living a very quiet sedentary life, you feel the energy moving in your body as a very real thing. And when you feel it stagnate, it disturbs your health and your meditation. And you go like, okay, so I'm going to do exercises to move the chi, literally. How do you do that? Through the joints. That's why postures Postures to stimulate the joints. Why stimulate the joints? To keep the meridian system healthy. The modern meridian theory is very important. It makes perfect sense now of why you do yoga. It makes no difference if you want to be a contortionist. That doesn't make any difference. 
to not exercise the connective tissue, to not exercise the joints, you're compromising the energy system of your body. If you want to be a world-class athlete, the average person lives to be 76, I think, now in the modern world. A world-class athlete lives to be 68. If you want to be a world-class football player, American football, you live to be 58. So if you want to be a football player, just take 18 years off your life and have a good time. Why? These are the biggest, strongest guys that are in sport. And they die 18 years younger than the average couch potato. My theory, if you bang up, scar up, and aggressively compromise the health of your connect connective tissue in your knees, your neck, your shoulders, and your spine, it's more than you're going to walk with a limp. You've now compromised the energy system of your body. Now, I believe the body is incredibly resilient. And if every once in a while you get an injury, you break your leg skiing, you'll recover. If every once in a while you overstress this, you'll recover. The body's amazingly resilient. But you can't go out and get in a car accident every Sunday for 10 or 15 years. Particularly if you don't have time or an interest to rehabilitate your body during these seasons and you just get more banged up and more banged up and more banged up over time. I believe the meridian theory explains this. That's my speculation. To injure the joint once in a while, look, everyone injures their joints once in a while. That's no big deal. But aggressive, world-class athletes, look, they essentially injure themselves for a living. And that's why they don't live to be 76 and have a limp. Because it's more than biomechanics. Stressing the joints is more than biomechanics. It's trying to keep the energy system of the body healthy, a modest, moderate exercise the joint and the necks and the spine and the knees is important not just to stay able to move but because the energy movement it's important to have this exercise of the tissues I believe that explains very clearly why the yogis did what they did why they developed such it's so bizarre if you stop and think about it yoga is just bizarre let's twist ourselves why you know, most yoga postures, if you carried most of the yoga postures too far, it'd, it'd kill anybody. Most of them. I can't think of, maybe dead man's pose, you'd be okay, but pretty much any pose, if you take it too far, would, would injure you. Isn't it a bizarre thing to have developed? To have, yeah, let's find a hundred ways to bend the body around. Why? They're motivated energetically. It's a big thing, the meridian theory. Because now, we shouldn't even call connective tissue connective tissue. That's a hangover from 200 years ago when they didn't know what the stuff was. It's enmeshed around every organ and joint of the body. It's like, let's cut that away to see what's inside. That's what they called it, connective tissue. Because that's all it does, it just sticks stuff together. It should be called meridian tissue. And we'd have a little more respect for it. Okay? It should be called meridian tissue. To show you how important this is, not because it justifies why you do yoga, yin or yang forms of yoga, by the way, but like when, when Nixon went to China and acupuncture became the rage, because they saw surgery being done with no anesthesia, just a few acupuncture needles put in, people go, whoa, it's hard to fake that. They spent some money, I don't know how much, but they spent some money trying to figure out how acupuncture works. Because every Western scientist knew there was no such thing as meridians. We know that. How do we know that? Because we've done thousands of dissections in the last 125 years, and we haven't found a meridian yet. That's a feudalistic superstition put forward by people who didn't do cadaver dissections. So they went in, and these thousands of dissections, with their probes and their scalpels, and they cut away the connective tissue to find the organs and they cut away the connective tissue looking for the meridians. What they were cutting away were the meridians. It changes everything 
to think of connective tissue as living, pulsating, not only for itself, but to be conductive to a life force that flows through the body. The next time you get a chance, pop open a grotesquely illustrated anatomy book and look where the connective tissue is. Connective tissue is everywhere. It's everywhere in the body. And when you read about how the yogis in India describe where do the nadis flow, which is their word for meridians, where do they flow? You'll either read, there are 360,000 nadis in the body. Or they'll say, there are 72,000 nadis of the body. Of those, 10 are the most important. And of those, 3 are the most important. And you never hear about these other ones again. How can you have 360,000 meridians in your body? When you look at the ubiquity of the connective tissue, it's going to like, well, it's everywhere. It's in everything. Life force must travel to every cell of the body. There's only one tissue that is ubiquitous from the surface of the skin to any internal organ you want to find. There's only one tissue that does that. Connective tissue, meridian tissue. One last little point to make. This is a DVD about yin yoga. So talk and talk and talk about why do yin yoga. But if you again, if you, next time you get a chance, you're bored, look through an anatomy book. Connective tissue is all through the muscles as well. All forms of yoga stimulate the meridians of the body. It is not a unique characteristic of yin yoga. The only reason why this elaborate presentation is not to set yin yoga apart from yang yoga or other forms of exercise. It's not to make it better. It's just to say, to take the same principles of lifting and stressing a tissue and exercise, apply to the yin tissues of the body just as well as the muscles. It's not meant to set yin yoga apart. It's meant to include it in the same operating exercising theories that we're doing with all the other tissues, whether it's bones, muscles, or teeth. It's not to make it different and set it apart and better and unique. It's not unique. That's the point here. It's not unique. It shares the living, growing, adapting to stress health that the other tissues have. So yin yoga, yang yoga, even forms of exercise that don't call themselves yoga, look, they're all working the meridians of the body because the meridians flow through the intestines, the heart, the lungs, and the muscles. What makes yin yoga unique is that it stresses the joints. Its intention is to stress the joints. Yin yoga is not going to make you stronger. It's not going to make you run the marathon. It's not going to do any of those things. It's not a complete system by itself. Hence the name yin, not Taoist, yin. Why this elaborate defense explanation of it? because of the mythology that you shouldn't stress your joints. That's a myth. Within limits, within moderation, biology demands that the tissues be stressed or they will be degenerated. Thank you for playing. <laughs>